Welcome everyone to today's Big Data and AI Toronto, Inspiring Women in Tech panel. My name is Erin McGuire. I will be your host and moderator today. I am thrilled and honored to participate in such a wonderful event with such talented and inspiring women in technology. In today's panel discussion, we'll explore with our women leaders, closing the gap, the gender gap in tech, empowering others through inspirational leadership, and the importance of diversity in fueling innovation. Before we get into our discussion, I would love to have our leaders introduce themselves. Kishana, do you wanna go first? Thank you, Erin. My name's Kishana Peck. I'm the founder and executive director of Toronto Women X in Data Science. We have a big vision to empower a million women to become data literate, and we have programming to support that. So we have our annual flagship conference, which is usually in, in April, and we have a data media club to help women learn about data through fun ways like books and movies and we also have an inclusive data fellowship program that's launching next year wonderful irena do you want to go next sure hi erin um my name is irina del jacobo and um i'm honored to part of be part of this panel um, so uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, some background about myself. Uh, I've been with IBM for about 17 years, including uh, my uh, internship, uh, student on call while I was finishing my studies and, um, and then full time position. Uh, I came to Canada in the 2000s and um, graduated computer science from uh, York University. And uh, my, I've I've held multiple roles in IBM. My current role is that I'm leading the DB2 ecosystem team. Uh, we're basically the core infrastructure team uh, that provides infrastructure, build and deploy and containerization processes for, um, for the whole DB2 development community. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Sonia, do you want to go next? Sure, thanks Aaron. Um, and I'm also honored to be here. So thank you very much for inviting us to this panel. Um, my name is Sonia Carino and I am the president of IAB Canada, which is the Interactive Advertising Bureau of Canada. And we represent the online advertising industry in, uh, in the country. And we have been around since 1997. I've been in the role personally for about six and a half years. Uh, and have been in the industry since its inception in, um, in around 1997 or 1998, um, really on the ground, uh, busting through a lot of the barriers, not only you know in terms of gender and what we're here to discuss today, but also um, just generally, um, you know, lots of challenges in the industry that we've seen over the over the past two decades, and uh, and it's really interesting times. It's been a really interesting journey. So look forward to discussing that and more today. Wonderful, thank you. Sasha? Awesome, um, hi everyone, it's nice that you meet you. My name is Sasha Fay. I am a Director of Data Science at Cineplex Digital Media, which is Cineplex, the theatre company you guys are probably more familiar with, our media arm. Um, I lead a team of data scientists and data analysts and we try to solve some media challenges in the digital out of home world. Besides that, I'm on the leadership team of Data for Good, which is a nonprofit organization that looks to help other nonprofits in the Waterloo region specifically um, solve some of their own challenges because they can't really afford their own data science resources. So I'm really excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, welcome everyone. And a little background on myself, Erin McGowan. I'm the VP of Sales Engineering at Data IQ. Data IQ is a data science and AI software company. So we help our customers take advantage of data and, and really strive to leverage data science to drive business impact and business innovation uh, within their organizations. So I have the wonderful opportunity to build out some wonderful uh, teams uh, with various different talents in, in data analytics, uh, machine learning and uh, you know we've had the wonderful opportunity of being able to you know not only build out the team with many backgrounds but we're really trying to strive for diversity in our hiring and so that's really near and dear to my heart let's get into our discussion so let's the first area i'd like to talk about is the gender gap in tech right it is 
tech has predominantly been a very male dominated field, but it's women like us that are, are changing the game, right? So I'd love to start off with, you know, what are some steps that we can take to close the gender gap in technology from your perspective? Sonia, do you wanna go first? Sure. Um, I think that there is, uh, I think, first of all, I'll start by saying that I think we've come a long way. So it's not all bad. I think that there's, you know, evidence by, you know, the panel today and several other panels that, um, you know, that we've been, we've been seeing. Um, there are increasingly more uh, women in the field of technology and sciences. So, um, so that's the good news. I think that, you know, some of the steps that we can take is to you know, look at, uh, you know, our entire organizational outputs and try to ensure that everything that we put together, everything that we put out um, is inclusive. And that doesn't necessarily only focus on gender, but it's just, a, you know, a, like from the ground up, looking at everything that we do. At IAB Canada, we run a lot of events, as an example. And, uh, and we have a lot of panel discussions and we have a, just a, a lot of outputs that we we like to put, you know, you know, industry papers and all that sort of stuff that gets out and fielded. And one thing that we've started to pay a lot more attention to is our programming. And uh, and oftentimes we kind of hit a wall. So we're trying to like put together a panel of, you know, topic X uh, in the technology field. And we run into the issue of like, well, none of the senior management people are women, right? So, so we were actually then having to reach out to some of our member organizations to ask for, you know, gender balance or for, or for a, a more diverse set of speakers and representatives of their organizations. And with, and those are difficult conversations to have. And I think that it's such a, it's, it, it seems like such a small, simple thing to do, but I think it's also just so meaningful to be able to have the conversation and say, look, I know this is awkward. I know you're the one who usually speaks at our events. But you know, is there anyone else that you would like to give an opportunity to? And um, and so that's one thing. And then the other thing is also having the responsibility, and we've seen it happen, and we love it when it happens, where um, the participants of the panel themselves, and sometimes these are um, male uh, supporters or they're they're the allies, right, in the room that get invited to speak, and their first question is how diverse is the panel? Because I have my own personal policy that states that I won't be on a panel unless there's fair representation. So that to me is just, and that should be celebrated. And those are, you know, just small steps, I think that need to be sort of made public and we need to, um, you know, make small changes that are very meaningful to our everyday stuff. I love that. I, I think that's really important and, you know, having, advocates, right? You know, male, female is, is very important because that's what drives change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's also just the, it's, sorry, it's also just the conversation, like it's the, it's the difficult conversation that you have to have then, right? I think, and that's something that, you know, women have historically not had a strong voice and they've, they've had cha challenges actually voicing their issues. Easier to talk talk with amongst themselves to roll your eyes and sort of say, this is so unfair, but much more powerful and valuable when you actually say it out loud to the to the source of the problem and to the person who is also able to make change. So that's just, I think, the essence of, of, of the, the takeaway. I agree. That's extremely impactful. Sasha, love to hear your perspective. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Sonia. It was really enlightening stuff. Um, from my perspective, I think it's really two things that I try to do. The first one is try to get um, kids from when they're younger. So I know personally when I was younger, um, I didn't really have that technology or analytics mentor to look up to. So I do volunteer at this organization called Technovation, which seeks to uh, um, find girls between the ages of 8 to 18, and we encourage them to build an app using actual coding to help solve a problem in their community. So we as adults can actually be mentors um, to help them drive that along and actually help them do basic coding. And it's nice for them to see themselves in your shoes so then they can, they can tell what they can be in the future. 
Um, the second thing that I see, because I am in my 30s, um, I see a lot of employers having a kind of like reskilling workshops for women who are re-entering the workplace. And I think that's really important, seeing my friends uh, leave for math leave or even take the traditional caregiver roles, that sometimes they have this imposter syndrome when they have to return and do the job that they held a year ago. And there's a lot of anxiety in that. And I think that fear sometimes makes people not return or perhaps they're too scared and they think they can't really do the work at the same level they could as before. So having an employer actually have um, upskilling as part of the re-onboarding, I think will help shrink that gender gap too. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that you, you highlighted a couple of things. The imposter syndrome is a real thing and it really does exist. And I think it's, great when we can acknowledge, hey, I have a little bit of that imposter syndrome, right? This is scary. And having that moral support from others around you, other female colleagues, other male colleagues, but it, it it's true, it's out there and it does exist. And I think acknowledging that, especially as women return to the workforce, right? It is scary, um, you know, scary <laughs> for everyone. So I really appreciated you bringing that up. Kishana? Um, yeah, so I'll just build on the points Sonia and Sasha mentioned. So for me, one of the key points to kind of focus on is I see a lot of diversity and inclusion efforts are focusing on recruitment, um, but there should also be a focus on retention, which is something that every business looks at everyone's looking at churn and acquisition all the time. Um, there should also be a focus on that for your diverse employees as well to be able to learn from maybe there's culture issues in the organization that you can make quick changes to, getting feedback from the employees that have left and also the ones that stay. Just getting that understanding of how you can build a more um, nurturing environment so women can thrive in technology because there's like on the road to a role in technology there's different there's different crossroads right um for example as sasha mentioned when you're younger do you engage in those stem courses yes or no so then you make a choice do you do the continuing education and university college or whatever you choose to train yourself yes or no after you graduate do you continue to do that stem field yes or no and then if you finally make it to the workplace and you are doing something in a stem field do you stay? There's leakage there as well. So I think it's really important to make sure that we are creating environments where women do want to stay in those tech roles. Retention is... is, is and we're back. So I just wanted to repeat the last question and we'll let Arena uh, address that question. So what are some steps we can take to close the gender gap in technology? Okay, so um, I think from um, from uh, closing the gaps, there's a few things that we can do, and I agree with all the answers um, that uh, Sonia, Kishana, and Sasha gave. Is um, from my perspective, there's it's two ways: uh, what the company that you're working for can do, and what we as parents or parents in general can do, um, because we we are taking small steps towards closing that gap. However, uh, we need to look into the future and how we close it into the future. So from a comp company perspective, I feel like uh, every company and every team within a company should look at their employees and take a look, look uh, and, and see how diverse are we in order to drive innovation. Um, if you know we're not diverse enough, then make a, make a point and make an effort to actually hire more, more uh, diverse personnel. Um, and uh, especially in positions with higher authority and executive positions, this is really important that we have a diverse and female representation over there. Um, from, uh, from a parent point of view, probably also school board point of view, I feel like the school board, I have two kids, I feel like the school board does not ha have enough emphasis uh, in their cu curriculum uh, into science and technology, enough for the world that we live in today. Um, and um, 
I'm not going to dive into, you know, curriculum changing right now, but um, from a company perspective, having events for girls such as STEM for girls uh, on an yearly basis uh, to help with this, to help expose children uh, to science and technology, expose the girls. Um, my company actually did something just before the pandemic hit us. Uh, they had summer camps at the place where we work, uh, so we can actually take your kid to work. You know, you don't worry about uh, getting, um, you know, finding summer camps to sign them up for. And uh, they teach them technology, math, science, crazy stuff. So uh, I took both of my kids there and they loved it so much. At the end of the summer camps, they said that they uh, they want to uh, they want to do what I do. So I don't know if they were extremely excited because of the cafeteria and then the Tim Hortons in the building, but I'm, I was actually very happy. And uh, I'm not lucky enough to have girls, but I have two boys, uh, and still um, we 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 do stuff together. And um, I think in general the gender bias around you know girls should not be just playing with dolls and playhouses. They should explore building, you know, what uh, the planets, technology, and whatever they can do with this, uh, and how technology can help us, you know, better the world for the future. I think we can start building that from now. So I feel like parents can actually help with that, with exposing their uh, children, girls or boys, to um, you know technology and science. I absolutely agree. I have three kids myself, and it's important, right? You know, from schooling that they get exposed, but environmental, right? What we teach them at home. Um, is, is really important. And how fantastic that uh, they can go to summer camp and, and see how cool mom's company is. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Sasha, you brought up something that I want to touch on. You know, one of the things that when we talk about women in technology and really making sure that women are set up for success, mentorship has proved to be a key to success and to retain women in those fields. I'd love to touch on, you know, some of the mentorship that your organizations are doing, uh, whether it's, you know, mentorship programs or just where it's maybe a buddy system, right? But how have you seen mentorship really, you know, support not only women in technology, but just enhance the organization? I think that that mentorship provides us some experience and exposure to new roles. And, you know, there's always professional development and here's what our jobs look like, but seeing it in action and having uh, a peer or colleague that can really provide guidance to us is really impactful. So I'd love to, to touch more on mentorship. Uh, Kishana or Sonia, do you have any thoughts with regards to uh, mentorship? Um, so for me, I do have, I do have my own mentors, um, which some of them are men, some of them are women, um, different races, everything. Um, and I find that they've been able to guide me well into my career um, and also kind of demystify like if I'm feeling imposter syndrome, which might just be like because of the environment I'm in, maybe has nothing to do with me. Um, but what's really helped me throughout my career is more sponsorship. Um, so that's the people who speak about my work when I'm not in the room. Um, who advocate for me to get on projects. Like I find like that more like action oriented um, flavor of mentorship has been really beneficial for me. And we're back. Wanted to transition into our next topic, empowering through inspirational leadership. So inspirational leadership drives people to reach great heights of performance and success and to demonstrate the qualities employees will follow. So I'd love to discuss, you know, what does inspirational leadership look like to you and who inspired you to get into tech? So two part question. Irina, do you wanna go first? Sure, um, that's a great question. Um, there's, um, there's a few things that I think are really important uh, as a, uh, to follow as a leader and therefore become an inspiration to someone and to your team. Um, so one of the things it's uh, lead by example. So you're not a boss. You're not there to micromanage people. You're leading your team, setting up goals for the future, but working with them hand in hand in order to achieve that goal. Um, so for example, you I feel like 
like you need to know your employees, what they're good at, uh, what they're working on, maybe even get your hands dirty a bit with some of the projects and get their hands on to understand the work better. And then you can help them actually um, uh, finish that. Um, I think uh, in general, when you're inspired and you're excited about what you do, uh, then they get inspired and excited. And it's just so exciting to, to actually do this and work as a team. Um, uh, the other thing that I think is really important is to to trust your employees and trust your colleagues, whoever we're working with. Um, me personally, I don't like to micromanage, um, and I never will because I think it could bring down morale. Um, and um, in general, people like to know that uh, they own something, that they can be trusted, that can be trusted with their work, uh, and they'll feel part of the team. They get a sense of ownership. In, in in inclusion and and they will do their best work um, when you actually trust your employees. Um, the other one is empowerment, where you give the right for your employees to make decisions, own projects end to end. You don't you don't just tell them you know do that task, do that task. You give them a project and say here's what we need to do. This is our end goal. Figure out how to do it. You know like from design, prototype, whatever. I feel like this is really exciting for everybody and sometimes you get tedious tasks that you have to do anyways, but once you're empowered to make project happen, it's 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 exciting stuff. Um, and so these are the things that I can uh, think of right now and uh, how I got inspired to get into tech. It's uh, much my parents, um, so both uh, both my mom and dad, uh, they are um, they have degrees in robotics and um, robotics and automation. Um, so I've I've been brought up with technology since I was very little. Um, and the funny thing is, I, every time I ask my dad a question, you know how this works or whatever, and then he'll be so excited he gets to explain something. <laughs> so he'll start explaining it and then draw a diagram and a graph, and it just takes so long that sometimes instead of asking him, I'll go and ask my mom. <laughs> so they uh, they've been very influential in this, um, and um, even still to this day, um, I feel like. I've been fortunate enough that I've been brought up uh, as someone who feels they can do absolutely anything. Um, so, which is which is great. Um, it's fortunate not everybody has that. Um, but um, I can code, you know, and I help my son learn coding. I can cook and help him learn cooking clean. Um, I can build stuff by myself, and I can do interlocking. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's like you can pretty much do anything you put your mind to it. And that's been my motto uh, for trying things out, getting them in just kind of hobbies and interests uh, that get there. And I, it's all thanks to my mom and dad. So I'm happy about this. That's wonderful. And it's uh, you know, just your earlier comment about now you're being the, the inspiration for your kids, right? Join mom at work. So I love that. <laughs> Sasha, would you like to go next? Yeah, so from my perspective, I think an inspirational leader really has a balance between excellence and teamwork, right? Building those relationships. So as far as excellence and work, an inspirational leader in my head has a really clear vision and they're able to you know, articulate that to their team. So their team knows what impact their work has. And as far as relationships, I think it's important for every leader to understand what motivates each person, similar to what Irina said herself. You kind of have to figure out what makes each person come to work and what they want to see in their own career. And then you try to layer that into your work objectives. So because I lead a team of data scientists, they're kind of all over the place on what they want to gain. Some people are just good individual contributors, whereas other people want to see the actual impact they're making firsthand. So what I t tend to do is I have um, a monthly meeting, we call it demo days, where people from my team have the ability to uh, showcase the work they're doing to the whole company. It's just like a five minute presentation, but it's still it's their face be seen and people can see that they're doing really valuable work. I think also another piece to uh, um, that relationships thing is having the sense of humility. Um, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room and having a team around you who can teach you things um, will earn you respect from your own team. And I think that's something I look for myself. As far as inspirational leaders, I'm pretty similar to Irina. 
Um, I am from the Caribbean. Um, I, I came here for university, so I didn't really have a lot of technology with me growing up. So I remember in my first year at the University of Waterloo, I was presented with this beautiful Mac desktop and I was being taught how to code. And it just went over my head because I wasn't really familiar with computers that well. And I remember being really nervous and scared, but my dad is the one who was really encouraging me to push on. And back then, that inspiration I needed was somebody just kind of driving me and saying, you know, it's okay to struggle, you can get through it. So at every different part in your life, there's definitely different levels of inspiration you need. And at that point, that is what I needed. Um, my inspirational leader right now, because I'm more in data science, is Cassie Kozikroff. You guys might know her. She's the chief data scientist from Google. I have never met her, so I'm a, a hidden um, admirer of her. But two things she does really well is she communicates technical ideas to the, a variety of audiences really articulately. That's something I personally strive to be, so that's the kind of inspiration I need right now. She also has a really good business mind, and I think to uh, really succeed in the private sector, you need to have the balance between tech and business, um, always driving towards revenue. So she is my inspiration, and that's kind of what I what I look forward to at this part of my journey. You touched on something. I just wanted to highlight that we find different inspirations where we are right in, in our life and in our career. And I think that's really important because we gain inspiration and motivation in so many different ways. So I love that you touched on that. Sonia, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, well, I, I'll start the other way around. And I'll, I, when I was, uh, I was, I must have been about 12 years old when, uh, when my dad gave me my first computer and basically, you know, said, here, figure it out. And, and it was, it was really cool because, um, you know, he came, he's a, he was a doctor, he came from a sciences background, but his, his vision was kind of like um, to basically make it so that it was like, this is your thing. You're now going to solve this. You're going to figure out DOS and you're going to figure out what this thing is about and you're going to figure it all out. So when you have something, then you can like, you know, when, once you figure it out. So it was like these little challenges and I think that that thematically has has followed me around as sort of an inspirational leadership trait is when somebody actually throws you into a problem solving situation. And, and I go back to what I was saying earlier without the foregone conclusion that you won't be able to do it. So this idea of trial by by fire and just sort of saying, here you go, that's on you now, like you have to figure it out. And it doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter what, you know, where you come from, what your background is, that you didn't know what DOS was before or that you don't know what a 96K modem is. Like, the, the, it, did, it doesn't matter. What matters right now is that we have a problem. I believe in you and I need you to go out there and solve it. And that is, to me, one of the most empowering things that you can do to an individual right, regardless of gender. And I think that that's been missing because of the fact that if there's been this this bias towards one, you know, the, the, the hunter, the gatherer sort of, you know, mentality that is ingrained in our DNA. And I think that that's a beautiful thing to watch unprogrammed from our society is that now it doesn't really matter. We're fluid and we're talking to each other like we've got a problem. I need these attributes in an individual to help me solve that problem. And, uh, and that's no longer in a box that's pink or that's blue, but rather it's just, you know, find me those attributes. So, um, so I, I, I really, I believe that leaders, you know, inspiring leadership should have, um, you know, the end goal in mind and, uh, and, and really throw people into the fire without the foregone conclusion that, you know, one, will, one person might be better than the other. Giving opportunities is key. And even if they seem like they're insurmountable, I think that given the opportunity to even fail is important. And then being there on the other end to, you know, be the shoulder as well as the person who kind of pushed you from the back like the cut with a coach. But if somebody fails to also be there and take responsibility for it together and collectively. I think that's that's really important is you know, having that support and, and, and the push, 
right? But you're not in this alone, right? I have you, I have your back. <laughs> that, that's, that's extremely uh, important from a motivational standpoint. Kishana, love to hear your perspective. For me, inspirational leadership would be like I I used to have a, a boss who like no matter if I thought I couldn't do it, <laughs> she believed I could do it um, and kind of reinforced that I could do it from like the track record that I had before. Um, so it's kind of like re-empowering your team as you go along because initially at the beginning, like I feel like it's usually like roses, but like that continuation of like inspiring and also like walking the talk, like what you expect from your team, you do the exact same thing um, and just being really true to your values. So a value of collaboration, like you're actually a collaborative leader <laughs> and your team sees that and they see that as success. So they as well are collaborative. Um, if you're someone who doesn't mind mistakes because you believe that mistakes actually leads to innovation, then like you walk that talk when your team does make mistakes and you kind of frame it in what can we learn from this. So I found for myself like that inspirational leadership um, were more leaders who aligned with what they said they believed in um, because then that also gives you leeway to be more aligned with what you believe in as well and to also subscribe to that um, which I've always found gets better outputs and also just a happier team. Um, how I was inspired to be in tech, it was actually a complete accident. <laughs> um, I wanted to be a consultant and I, and I believed if I was a consultant who had information to back up my ideas, then my ideas would be foolproof. And then <laughs> this led me into learning about data and analytics and it just captured me since and I've been stuck in it and I'm here. So um, what continues to inspire me is seeing people who are minoritized and not really the like cookie cutter what you expect to be in data and data science, um, killing it, dominating and doing such good work in different streams in data. And that's what keeps me interested and involved and inspired. Thank you all that. I, I loved hearing, you know, what inspirational leadership looks like to everyone. You know, for me, a common theme that I heard across all four of you was positivity, right? And that's something that's really important to me is those coach that pushed you, right? And encouraged you even when you didn't think you could do something, right? Positivity is contagious. And, and that really is an underlying um, factor when we think about, you know, what great leaders are, is they encourage, they're positive, and that truly is inspirational. I'd like to transition to our third topic for today around diversity and inclusion. So a substantial diversity and inclusion strategy can help organizations attain top talent and drive innovative outcomes. So I'd love to hear what are some innovative outcomes you have witnessed or participated in at your organization influenced by diversity and inclusion? And I will let volunteer, I'll let you volunteer for this one. I can go. Great. Can, yeah, okay. Um, well, we started, uh, we started in a uh, diversity and inclusion uh, working group for the IAB, um, more for the, in for the industry as a whole, just to get a better understanding of um, how can we participate? How can we be helpful, um, you know, without becoming a diversity and inclusion association, right? So, so it was, it was very surgical about like, what, what is our role in the industry and what, what are some of the things that we could do? And I spoke about it earlier, which was, you know, like things like events and making sure that our events were, uh, were diverse and inclusive. Um, and uh, another area is education. We do a lot of courses. Um, and I think that a key area for us to start getting um, more inclusive is to have representation uh, from an instructor standpoint, 
right? So leadership that is, you know, meaningful, that is, uh, that is, you know, in a, in a position of education, that is in a position of authority, that helps the industry to thrive, um, you know, I think is, is good news for everyone. And then the last thing, well, I mean, two, two other things is uh, we created a diversity and inclusion, uh, an inclusion, um, equity and inclusion uh, charter uh, that we uh, put forward to all of our members just to generate the awareness of the issue and to also buffer the fact that moving forward, we would be having those difficult conversations. So we will be asking you for um, to give people within your organization, because we know they run deep. There's not just two people at your organization that can speak on a stage. We're going to ask you to please give opportunities to your employees um, to step forward and become part of the thought leadership community. Share it and pay it forward. So that's uh, that's number three. And then the fourth one is board representation. And our board is actively looking at how can we create at the board level and at the executive level uh, more diversity and inclusion because that's really um, you know the key is senior management. Um, it was been mentioned before, but it's like that is something that is still woefully underserved in our in our sector is the leadership. Right, leadership is extremely important. I think we have time for one more response. If you'd like to go. Um, I could give one. Um, Sonia's answer was so thorough and awesome. So many good ideas in that. <laughs> Um, from my perspective, just at a smaller scale, um, we do something called demo days that I know I mentioned before. But what I have started to do, because I'm the host of it, is try to have it as like a female only led version of demo days, where we ask the senior management team to purposefully seek out females who do not usually have their voice heard and have them showcase the work that they're doing. And that kind of ties into something that I personally believe in, which is more amplifying um, women or diverse people. So irrespective of your organization, uh, this is like a nice tactic that I like to do. So, for example, if you're in a meeting, you can say, you know, hey, did you hear what person XYZ said last week? Or they had some good ideas. Let me bring them to the next status meeting so they can see they discuss their own ideas, right? That's you amplifying their voice. Um, when they themselves have a really small voice because they're in a small team. So you as a leader can, you know, seek out those people, listen to them. They will have good ideas and then you try to amplify it in other meetings so people start to get to know them more. I love that. Sasha, Kishana, Irina, Sonia, thank you so much for joining me today. This was so much fun. I loved hearing your, your stories, what inspired you, and how we can improve and increase more women in tech, right? That's why we're all here. Uh, again, thank you for the audience for, for joining in, um, and uh, have a great rest of your day.